Cardigan Mountain School offers a close-knit community that prepares middle school boys mind, body, and spirit for responsible and meaningful lives in a global society. To achieve our mission, we reward effort and accomplishment, helping each boy realize his academic, physical, and personal potential through the integration of the following core values in all aspects of daily life. Compassion. Be kind. Seek to understand others and go out of your way to help. Integrity. Be honest. Remain true to yourself and your word. Respect. Be considerate. Care for yourself, others, and Cardigan Mount School. Courage. Be brave. Face adversity with strength and persistence. Welcome, everybody. Really good to see all of our dorm families out here. Uh, welcome to Greenwood out in the, the back row back there. Great to have you. Our day students are here and our remote learners who will be joining us later in the school year are also going to be able to watch this as well. It's, it's really, really amazing to have the whole community together right now. You've just heard the mission statement of Cardigan Mountain School, along with our four core values, compassion, integrity, respect, and courage. This is what we gather here to celebrate, the opening of another year to live the Cardigan way as a community and as people who are a part of something greater than ourselves. Traditionally, the sun would be down and we would be in the chapel right now for this ceremony. Sure, this is different, but the mission and the values are the same. And no obstacle will prevent us from journeying onward and upward. Each fall, we choose a theme to guide us for the academic year. Last year, it was Respect the Climb. This year, Cardigan's 75th anniversary, our theme is Carry On. This year, we are charged with carrying on the tradition and character of our school, built by so many before us. By now, you are all aware of the worldwide rallies for racial equity, for social justice. And we have chosen to carry on the work that many have dedicated their lives to by focusing on how Cardigan can be a more inclusive community that provides individuals an equal opportunity to achieve their best. Finally, as we sing in our hymn, we must carry on through storm or weather fair. When you have that moment, when all you want is to be at home, not wearing a mask, wishing that it was the good old days before COVID-19, thinking about how unfair and disappointing the current circumstances are. I hope you can say those two words and hold your head high. None of you need to be here, including our remote learners abroad, but Cardigan needs you. The world calls you, and here you are. I'm honored now to introduce our speaker for today's ceremony, Ms. Danielle Fideli. I'm going on my third year of working with Ms. Fideli in the Student Life Office, and I want to start her introduction with a brief history lesson. For those who don't know, Ms. Fideli is our Dean of Students. The three years before she accepted the responsibility, in the middle of summer vacation, I'll add, we had three different deans. Dealing with student behavior and leading the school's disciplinary response is hard work. And some have suggested that no person should carry that burden for too long. Well, it may be a burden, but it is one Miss Fidelli chooses to carry because she cares. She cares about you and this school, past, present, and future. I venture to guess that she does not wake up in the morning and think to herself, it's a beautiful day to get someone in trouble. Rather, she chooses to do this work while service and love drive her actions. When you look in the bleachers, to the sideline, or behind the glass, you will very likely see Miss Fideli cheering you on at your game. When you perform at a concert or act in a play, 
you will see Miss Fideli applauding in the theater. And when you are working on your essay at nine o'clock at night, you will see that Miss Fideli is still giving you 100% of her attention as you continue to climb ever closer to your best self. We are all fortunate to have Miss Fideli cheering and supporting us, and we should be grateful that she has the courage to hold us accountable as well. Now, let the learning begin. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Fideli to give our opening ceremony remarks. Thank you, Mr. Novak. Let me start this address with a wholehearted welcome. Gut honest truth, I am thrilled that each and every one of you are with us on this incredible ride this year. It brings my heart such joy to look out and see us together, physically together. In this address, I wanna talk about the theme for the year, Carry On, and I wanna talk about how fundamental our core values are to carrying on. Compassion, respect, integrity, and courage are the key to the ability to carry on with faith, with hope, and with strength. In particular, I wanna take a look at how compassion in action is essential. Here's what you can expect from your time at Cardigan if you truly learn to value core values of compassion, integrity, respect, and courage. You will be deeply challenged and convicted by the examples of others. You will be inspired by stories and you will be equipped with practical life-changing skills. So right now I wanna give you the stories. I'm gonna give you three stories and they're about strength and unity and compassion for others. Meaning even when you have your own problems, because we all have problems, we've all got stuff that we're going through. But even in the midst of that, can you look and see someone in need? So before we get into it though, before I get into the stories, I wanna tell you something. And this is really, really important. Take a look around at the adults that are surrounding you because there's something you need to know about each and every one of them. They are really good at their jobs. These teachers are going to walk beside you and guide you through your messes and help you to see what you need when you need it. They're going to guide you on this journey because they care and they know their stuff. You also need to know that you belong here. If you've ever doubted that you belong here, if people like you go to school here, doubt no further. Each and every one of you sitting here belongs here. You are one of us. And you can succeed here. If you put in effort and you care with intention, you can improve in knowledge and skill and character. And the last thing I need you to know is that what you do here today and every day matters. On a deep, meaningful, globally important level, because Cardigan is about that. It's about becoming the man you want to be in the future intentionally every single day. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna tell you three stories, a folk tale, a knight's tale, and a miracle. Look for compassion in each of them. Compassion is a word that's made up of two parts, come and passion. The passion part, a lot of times we think of that as something we really like to do, but the root of the word passion is suffer. So when you have a passion, it means you're willing to suffer for it. Come passion, you are suffering alongside someone else. So when you put yourself not in a convenient way, not in your way, right? The, the reading says when you go out of your way, when it causes you maybe a little bit of inconvenience, maybe a little bit of pain to help, that's compassion. So first the folk tale. This is an African folk tale about the strength of unity from the Bavenda tribe. It's a Bantu speaking people who inhabit the villages of South Africa. 
and they follow ancient customs in training their young people in remote mountain forests from about the ages eight years old, where they undergo secret discipline in separate schools. So as in much of Africa, storytelling is a central part of training youth in the wisdom of people. And this is this is a short little folktale. A lion used to prowl about in a field in which four water buck used to dwell. A water buck is like a deer. It's got big, long antlers, though. Many a time, he tried to attack them. But whenever he came near, whenever the lion came near these water buck, they turned their tails one to another so that whichever way the lion approached, he was met by the horns of one of them. At last, however, they fell a quarreling. They started fighting. And each went off to pasture alone in a separate corner of the field. The lion then attacked them one by one and soon made an end of all four. This folk tale is about the strength and unity. It's about having each other's back. It's about the fact that when you are together, you can look to the left and look to the right and know that the person on your left and the person on your right has your back, that there is no danger from within. We don't have literal lions at Cardigan Mountain School, but lions don't look like lions. Lions might look like fear. Lions might look like anxiety. Lions might look like sadness. Lions might look like rejection. Lions might look like racism. Lions might look like bullies or offensive words. The world around us is filled with danger. It's filled with things that are trying to make our lives miserable. It's nothing personal, it's just the way it is. At any time and from anywhere, there are a number of forces that are working to hinder us. In caveman times, that was literally the case. They were threatened by all sorts of things that could end their time, a lack of resources, a tiger, or weather. And the same is true today, the threats might just look a little bit different. But it is the company we keep and the people around us that will determine where we invest our energy. The more that we trust that the people to the left of us and the right of us have our backs, the better equipped we are to face the constant threat of danger from the outside. But we have to feel that there is no danger from within. If we can pull together as a unified team, we will better be able to survive and thrive from anything that comes at us from the outside. Because there are always conditions. Folk tales and fairy tales are particularly good at reminding us of this because there's always villains or dragons or monsters or lions. But now the knight's tale. And first I want to tell you this quote about fairy tales. So there's this quote from G.K. Chesterton that says that Fairy tales are not responsible for producing fear or any shapes of fear. Fairy tales don't give a child an idea of the evil or the ugly because that's in the world already. What fairy tales give a child is his first idea that villains and monsters and dragons can be defeated. They can be beaten. So I'm going to tell you the story of King Arthur, before he was King Arthur, this is from a book called The Sword and the Stone, and it's part of a bigger work called The Once and Future King. And at this point, in the very beginning of The Sword and the Stone, King Arthur is called Wart by his older brother, who has decided that's the nickname he's going to give him for with no choice of his own. So Wart and Kay, his brother's name is Kay, are living together, but Arthur, who he's calling Wart, is actually an orphan and he's taken in by Kay and his dad to live together and they, they learn together, they have school together. Um, and one day, Kay's dad, Sir Ector, is busy. So he's gotta go off and work in the field. It's July, that's hard working months. Um, and so Kay, his older brother, that's mischievous, but he never gets in trouble because he's the heir to the throne, takes out the hawk that this guy, Hob, has been training hard work every single day, training this hawk. 
And of course, when Kay takes out the hawk, he brings Wart with him and he loses the hawk into the woods. Kay doesn't care. He doesn't care about the hawk. He doesn't care about the fact that Hob has been training this hawk for about his whole life. But Wart cares. He cares about the fact that Hob is going to be heartbroken that this hawk is missing. And so he ventures into the woods. And here's something you need to know about the woods. This is a direct from the story. Wart would not have been frightened of an English forest nowadays, but the great jungle of old England was a different matter. It was not that there were just wild boars in it who would be at this season furiously rooting about, not that one of the surviving wolves might be slinking behind any tree with pale eyes and saddling chops. The mad and wicked animals were not the only inhabitants of the crowded gloom. When men themselves became wicked, they took refuge there. Outlaws cunning and bloody as the gore crow and as persecuted. The wart thought particularly of a man named Watt, whose name the cottagers used to frighten their children with. He had once lived in Sir Ector's village and the wart could remember him. He, had squ he squinted, he had no nose, and he was weak in the wits. The children threw stone at him, stones at him. One day he turned on the children and caught one, made a snarly noise and bit off the child's nose. Then he ran into the forest. But Watt was supposed to be in the forest still, running on all fours and dressed in skins. There were magicians in the forest also in those legendary days, as well as strange animals not known to modern works of natural history. There were regular bands of outlaws who lived together and shot arrows which never missed. There were even a few dragons, though these were small ones, which lived under stones and could hiss like a kettle. Added to this, there was the fact that it was getting dark. The forest was trackless, and nobody in the village knew what was on the other side. The evening hush had fallen and the high trees stood looking at the wart without a sound. So he is terrified, rightly so, of everything in that forest that's looking out to get him. And he does still pursue that hawk. He starts getting shot at by the archers that he, res that he was referring to, the outlaws that lived in the forest. And he still takes heart. Then he sees in the distance that a knight is coming by. And here's something he remembers about a knight and that gives him a little bit of hope. He remembers that a knight, in order to be one, has to take a vow. And their vow is that they have to help a person in distress. And so he thinks, this is my luck. I have this knight here. It's his vow. He's got to help me. I'm in distress. So as he approaches the knight, though, he realizes that the knight is on a mission to find a beast that he can't find and he's been on that mission for 17 years and they start talking about this questing beast that the knight is looking for wart never even mentions that he's lost in the woods and that he's terrified and that he wants to go home and that he lost this hawk that he's desperately looking to find and he notices that the knight is dejected and depressed over this beast that he hasn't been able to find for 17 years and this is what arthur says Here's, here the knight's visor began to droop so much that the wart decided he had better forget his own troubles and try to cheer his companion. I love this part of the story because this is so important. It does not matter who has the title of knight. Arthur is called wart. The knight on the horse is not the true knight. Arthur is the person who has set aside his own troubles to help someone in distress. So it doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter if you have a title. Be the person that steps out of your way to help someone else. We all have troubles and they're real and they're hard. But when you can do that, your life has immense purpose. So I have one more story for you. This one's a miracle. And it's a story about Jesus and a little boy. It's a really famous story from the Bible. I want you to notice both of their acts of compassion. 
setting themselves aside for the good of others. So this story is often referred to as the feeding of the 5,000. This story is unique because it's the only story that's told in all four Gospels. Mark and Luke refer to it as a miracle, but John calls it a sign. And I like that because signs point to something greater and they guide us toward a destination, but they're not the destination themselves. So what happens is the disciples have all returned from mission work. They've been preaching, they've been healing the sick, they've been journeying, they've walking on foot two by two, and they come back together as a group finally for the first time in a long time. And they are telling Jesus about everything that they saw. They're seeing people get healed. They're seeing hearts changing, but they're exhausted. And they have some really, really bad news to tell Jesus. The unfortunate news that they heard on the road that they have to tell him is that his first cousin that he grew up with as a brother, John the Baptist, was just killed. He was beheaded. And in that place of grief and exhaustion, Jesus wants to find a quiet place. So he says, all right, let's go find a quiet place where we can just mourn and rest. And that's what I would want to do. I would want to just mourn and rest. His disciples are bone tired and their souls are thin. So he leads the group to this lake to go take rest. But as they get to the lake, instead of a spacious shoreline, they see a massive crowd. 5,000 people have come to hear them speak. Jesus doesn't go away. He looks up, he sees the crowd, and he responds with compassion. Exhausted, grieving, tired, he decides that this is a greater need than his own personal grief. And in the midst of his own need, he sees theirs. So even though his plans are delayed, he opens his arms and instead of an interruption, he sees hearts and souls. Jesus never sees people as interruptions. He always stops for the one or the many. So amidst his grief, hardship and exhaustion, he does something, he sees and he acts. He asks Philip first, because he thinks these, these people have got to be hungry. If there's 5,000 people in this one area, they've come from a long ways away. These people are hungry. So he asks Philip, where should we buy bread? Philip basically says there's no way that we can feed these people. We certainly don't have enough food to feed 5,000 people, and we don't even have enough money. It would take six months salary on all our parts to buy food for all these people. So Philip's response is not happening. So then Jesus turns to Andrew one of the other disciples. And Andrew has a different posture because he's just received note from this little boy. And he says, we don't have enough food, but this kid has a few biscuits and a couple small fish. I know it's not gonna go far, but it's a start. And before I go on to the miracle, because of course a miracle happens, let me just say how absurd that would sound to the rest of the group that Andrew just said a couple small biscuits and fish is going to feed five, or is a start to feed 5,000 people. This is a couple hundred people and a few small biscuits and a few fish is an absurd start to 200 people, let alone, let alone 5,000. But it's possible that Andrew and the little boy who offered his lunch knew something that we can often overlook, which is that our part is simply to bring what we have Whatever you have, bring it. The outcome is not ours to control. And whatever his intentions were, that's what Andrew does and that's what the small boy does. So Jesus takes the lunch, lifts up the loaves and gives thanks. Then he breaks the bread and distributes it to the crowd and everyone receives as much as they need with leftovers to spare. A miracle happened. This story reminds us that generosity of time, of spirit, of talents, of goods shouldn't spark anxiety. We often worry if we give what little we have, there's gonna be nothing left for us. But that's not how things work in God's economy. 
Notice also that they performed a miracle with a young boy. Jesus invited this kid in and probably no one in the crowd knew that a miracle was happening except for the one little boy that gave his lunch. He knew the full extent of what was happening, the one who gave. So stop counting yourself out. Give whatever you have, no matter what the situation is. And when you offer, offer your own time, talents, and comforts for the good of others, you will be blessed. And you just might witness the miraculous. If you think like this, your days and your moments will always have purpose. So what do these stories have to do, particularly with carrying on our theme? Carrying on is when moments of adversity become moments of greatness. Sometimes greatness is the ability to go a single step. Sometimes greatness is the ability to see, truly see someone else. Sometimes greatness is joining in a circle of safety with your brothers to the left and the right of you when he is in danger from one of the world's lions. Something I think is crucial to understand is that nothing great is also easy. There's a really helpful series of commands to give yourself when you need to persevere through something difficult in order to achieve something great. Be strong. Do the work. It is not going to be easy, but it is going to be worth it. And of course, when I say be strong, I'm talking about a strength of heart. Courage has the same root word, correo, as heart. Core values are about the heart. They're about your being influencing your doing. At Cardigan, we want you to become the kind of people who by instinct value to do the right thing. So let me touch back on that quote about fairy tales. I'm not here to tell you that the monsters and dragons, evil and ugly exist because you already know that. I'm here to tell you that they can be beaten. They can be defeated. Create a circle of safety at Cardigan Mountain School protect each other, look out for one another, love each other in a way that requires courage. We want you to delve into this marvelous and difficult world that we live in with all of its complexities. Let's enjoy this cardigan adventure together. Let's work hard to create safety and no danger from within. And always remember that you are loved more than you know. Have faith, take heart, help the other fella and carry on. It's not going to be easy, but it is going to be worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fideli, for uh, those remarkable words and stories. I think uh, there's a whole lot of takeaways for all of us and uh, hopefully everybody found something in there uh, that, that is useful for you. It's always fun to hear stories and to think about the meanings they have for you and especially learning about uh, the lions that surround us in this world. Uh, as Ms. Fideli suggested, you know, some of them we can see, some of them we know about, but most of them we can't. It's one of the reasons why all of us are wearing masks right now. Some lions are invisible, but they're lions still. And together we can defeat them by having each other's backs. And I really, really appreciate those words. What an incredible message for us to start our year so that we can carry on together. Being compassion, setting ourselves, our own selves aside for the betterment of others, for the good of others, is one of our core values. It's one of the things that we do so especially well here at Cardigan. Whether here on the point, or far, far away, if you're far away right now and watching this and you're a cardigan brother, you're still a cardigan brother even though you're far away. I know that you're all finding your way here at Cardigan. If you're a new student, you're trying to figure out routines and patterns. As a human being, that's what you do. 
Humans are wired that way. We want to create patterns and routines in our lives so we can make sense of things. You're getting to know new people, new experiences, new challenges and opportunities, new food, new things. If you're a returning student, this year you don't really have the same amount of familiarity that most returners are accustomed to when they come back to Cardigan. Because in some ways, I'm glad about that. Everything's a little bit different for everybody, students and faculty alike. We're all experiencing some newness and some unfamiliarity. And that can produce some fear or uncertainty if we're all by ourselves. But just like in the dark when you were a little child and you might have been afraid of the dragons or the things that might or may not have been there, once you turn on the light, you realize you're okay. It's good that we're outside today. It's good that we're in the light and here together. We're relying on each other to do the right thing as individuals, to navigate our lives together this fall so that we can be safe, so that we can carry on together. That's truly committing to something greater than oneself, and I'm so proud of this committee, uh, community, students and faculty alike, for the great effort and attitude that you've brought to the start of this year. Last spring, those of you who are here, you remember we all had to go home and to go distance learning. And I told the community that we were alone in this together. And that was my message to everybody. Well, now we're together in this together. And that means a lot. We'll still need the same reliance on one another for strength, but we also have to cooperate and trust each other. And as Ms. Fideli suggested, we need to have each other's backs. We need to love one another and know that the person next to us is looking out for us because that's the only way we're going to defeat the lions if we stick together back to back. Let's do that. This year is a gift. Ms. Fideli, I'm glad you talked about how great the faculty are here. And the staff, many of whom aren't here right now because they're all working to make your school, our school, a better place, a cleaner place, so that we have food to eat. These are all people that are pulling on the same rope. And that's part of the gift that you have, that you've been gifted. You need to do your part. Do your part by helping out. Help the other fellow. Be kind to one another. Understand that there's a lot going on in everyone's life. And we all have to assume the best and trust that we're all doing the best we can under the circumstances. Under the circumstances, every single one of us is always doing the best we can because circumstances change. I want you to think about personal goals for this year. I'm sure when your parents brought you here they talked about a lot of things but one of them was to have a great year and do a great job and have some goals. I hope you have some goals. No matter what those goals are I hope you work hard to achieve them. Each of you has power to make choices in your life, to achieve the goals that you want to achieve. I hope you choose to have that power. We're here together so that each of us can help one another achieve those goals. I'm so excited for the year ahead. I can't believe we're all here together. We've worked so hard and it's been so long. And I'm so glad to see all of you here. And I know it's been a tough start. But as Ms. Fideli said, Great things are often really hard to achieve. And we're a great thing. Cardigan is a great thing. It's a great place. And you're part of the family. I can't wait to work with all of you. I know the faculty and the staff are so excited to work with all of you, new and returning. And together we will carry on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Day. In a few minutes, we're going to sing a very beautiful song, our school hymn. Um, all of the groups received song sheets. Please make sure that the new students uh, have access to all of those. And before we sing, it's worth reminding you guys that 
with an element of separation between us during the school year, that singing will bring us together. This isn't just a beautiful song we're singing. This is a profession of the values that your peers and Mr. Novak and Ms. Fidelli and Mr. Day talked about. It's a profession of the values by which we abide here at school. So when you sing the lyrics, think about what they mean. And afterwards, maybe ask a friend what they mean. Most importantly, sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you're going to follow through with those very words every single day this year. For now, please rise for the Cardigan Hymn. bow your heads for the final blessing. Father God, we stand before you today a thankful people. We are thankful for our health, thankful for the more than 322 negative COVID tests since we arrived on campus and counting. Miraculous. We are thankful for Headmaster Day, our Board of Trustees, and the administrative operations and health center teams who have worked nonstop to stay one step ahead of the chaos, recreating schedules, organizing dorms, finding a way to safely open our school in spite of enormous challenges. We are thankful for the flexibility and resilience of our faculty and staff. We are thankful for our families who have sacrificed so much for us to be here. We are thankful that most of us will be in actual live classrooms in just a few days and we look forward to the time when the rest of our brothers will join us. Father, bless our year ahead. Help us to lead beautiful, fruitful lives guided by your gentle wisdom. Keep us on the path of your purpose. Help us to love one another selflessly and may our hearts always remember to be grateful. Amen. So that concludes our service today. Uh, dorm, uh, each dorm is going to receive a carry-on wristband, so if you could uh, choose somebody to come up to Mr. Uh, Novak, you can uh, get the wristbands for your dorm. Thank you and have a wonderful day in New Hampshire.